ಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಜಯ ಅಕ್ಷರ್ ಪುರುಷೋತ್ತಮ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ಜಯ ರಾಧಾ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ದೇವನಿ ಜಯ ಸಿಯಾವರ ರಾಮಚಂದ್ರ ಭಗವಾನ ಜಯ ಉಮಾಪತಿ ಮಹದೇವನಿ ಜಯ ಗುರುಹರಿ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ಜಯ ಗುರುಹರಿ ಮಹನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ಜಯ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮಹಾರಾಜ ಶತಾಬ್ದಿ ಮಹೋತ್ಸವ ಜಯ in the divine presence of bhagwan swami narayan in the equally divine presence of my guru hari pramukh swami maharaj guru hari mahan swami maharaj in the revered presence of param pujya dr swami who has nursed and nurtured me since i was a very young sadhu and once again at the cost of repetition in the most cherished and precious presence of all of you whom i treasure like deep friends some of you whom i have had the great fortune to visit your office his excellency abdul hussain ali mirza the minister dr shafi his home i have visited i have been fortunate enough to visit the home of dr buwali ji and a very close person who i treasure very deeply walid kanu something i felt and something which i am going to treasure all my life mohammad nur sultan ji and ibrahim al dosari who i have been in touch for so long something that i have felt and continue to keep saying again and again that when i came to your homes and your offices you not only open the doors of your home but i found a permanent home in your hearts as well and that's what i treasure is the care and kindness no amount of light can match love no amount of comforts can match care is the care and love that we have discovered in this part of the world that we take across all over and wherever we move and go a country is not normally measured or evaluated by the size its footprint the gdp and gnp but by the quality of its countrymen it produces and i believe bahrain has the highest standard of people that it creates and produces it is not just a matter of sitting together it is not just a matter of standing together as you can see love is more than just holding hands and hugging each other love is even more than just looking at each other it is like looking in the same direction towards the same goal love is not just a matter of making yourself happy and your fair family comfortable 
Love is actually our duty and a collective responsibility to create waves after waves that touch the skies and actually cover the cosmos. That is the symbol of love and the power of love. I would like to tell you that each one of us values love. Perhaps it's the most used word and also most abused word. Perhaps it is something that we use so commonly and we actually dispense over the counter so easily. But love, as you see, has a much deeper meaning that we must all explore and treasure. To give you a classic example, let's come back to this whole to really experience what power of love is. Suppose you leave your seat and you've gone out for some work just for a few minutes. And when you return to your own seat and you discover a handwritten note, I love you. What will happen to you? Despite the fact you're married. <laughs> Despite the fact you're in a public assembly to discover a note on your chair, handwritten, I love you. Suddenly you feel that you are the most important guy or woman in this entire auditorium. You've not even found out who's written it. We don't even know why it's been written. It might be even a misplaced note. It was meant for somebody else and it's landed in your chair. Still, the fact that you feel that someone loves you creates a different you. But suppose you've gone out and you come back to the same chair and you find 300 notes on the same chair and all written that I love you, then it's definitely you. And it's not just one, there are 300 people inside this hall, that means the entire audience has written to you that I love you. Then the whole world of yours will suddenly be painted in gold. The birds will begin to sing at midnight. You won't see the roof, you'll see the stars under the roof. Everything becomes rosy. The fact of feeling loved does so much to one person. I just want to ask you, if you gave love, what a difference it would make to people around you. Love has the power to change so many things. Sometimes we are used to, because we live in this civilization where we are fond of writing little lines, poetries, couplets. And most of us, you know, forward old messages. Please don't forward old messages because the guy you send to them, they know they are forwarded. But most of us live in this age when we actually make use of words and easily communicate our love through words. But love is independent of words. Why? As I discussed with Dr. Shafi and his beloved friend, Ever since you are a baby, when you are not able to write the word love or even speak it, when you did not really know what the word love meant, ever since you were a baby, you responded to love. And even in your final years, when you are old and too weak to even speak the word love, you will still respond to love. Love has the power I'll explain further. It keeps making me think that why is it that little babies feel secure in the weak arms of their mothers and begin to cry in the strong arms of a stranger? Nobody's told it. Why is it that we constantly Seek love and hunger for love. Love is seen when the mother stays awake till midnight, worrying about the child who has not returned home in time. That's love. Love 
is not just necessarily hugging and holding hands. Love is not a noun, it is a verb. It is always felt and seen in action and less in a noun. We also feel that sometimes in our own stomach we get butterflies. We get goosebumps on our skin. Our mind begins to spin. Sometimes we feel we're on top of the world just because either you're in love or you have felt love or you feel loved or you love someone else. Look at the magic love can do to you and me and everyone when we realize this, that the power of love is immense. Forget about the world. The power is there to actually change the life that we live. It's mystical. It's magical. It's irrational. You know, sometimes, why are we so passionate about things we like? And impassionate about things we dislike. They may be the silliest things, the smallest things, but you love them, so you are passionate. And sometimes something very important, but if you don't love it, you are impassionate. So ultimately, love is not just a power that opens the chambers of a child's heart. It is also the secret that opens the secrets of the entire universe. There is not one religion on the face of this earth that does not point to love, to learn the secrets of spirituality of God and the universe. You bring me one religion. Every religion says love for God. Every culture says love for your fellow brothers. There is not a single, even a tribal religion or a tribal culture that tells you don't love your family. But what happens? We are so busy in loving ourselves that we forget the family. <laughs> we forget the culture, the community. We forget everything around us because somehow in our search or movement for love, we have forgotten to find the truth. You know how powerful it is? Once, a parents who were doting on their child, suddenly they found that the child is no longer responding. And he's distant. He's depressed. He's morose. So they took him to a special child psychologist and said, you know, this is our child. We have an issue with him. Can you please try and find a solution? The doctor said, what's wrong with your child? He says, a problem child. The doctor started looking. And then he said, wait a minute. Um, what have you given him? He said, we've given him the best toys, the best comforts, the best schooling, the best everything that somebody could have. We have given him everything. He said, but do you give him love? The parents said, you know, yeah, we give him love. He said, listen, I'll give you two things. I'm giving you medicine for the child. Tell him to give him this medicine morning, evening, and afternoon. And I'm giving you a regime of medicine for you as well as parents. He said, what's the medicine that we should give to our child? He said, morning, evening, and afternoon, give him love, love, and love. The parents were a little wise. They said, sir, what if it doesn't work? He said, double the dose. <laughs> it always works. You try it, and it works. Because as we move along, somebody has said that the world would be much finer and better with a little more love and little more kindness. And that somebody is nobody, little ordinary guy. You must have heard of the name Aldous Huxley. The man responsible for writing the classic Brave New World. Movies have been made upon it. For 45 years, he became one of the finest writers, thinkers of his time, who has published notes, short stories, novels, Poetry, philosophy, ranging from psychology to parapsychology to metaphysics and sociology. Aldous Huxley, do you know what he writes? That it is getting embarrassing for me. After studying and doing research on human psychology and sociology, it is getting increasingly embarrassing for me to tell the world that the only advice I can give to mankind 
is to be a little kinder. After studying cultures, and if I stand before you and I just tell you, be a little kinder to your kids, you say, Swamiji, that I know. But that's the only thing you need to do. Be a little nicer to your wife. You say, Swami, that's what I am. You better tell her. <laughs> but that's the only advice even the wisest give because that is something which we know but we hardly do. So coming back to it, he goes one step further and says that without love, the whole world would be a graveyard. Without love, the whole world would be a graveyard. You'll say, how? Let's experiment. Take away love from your home. It becomes a guest house of rooms where we just come every night to retire and sleep. Take away love from your family. It becomes just a club where every night we just get together to eat. Take away love from husband and wife. They become simple living partners who are responsible for no one and nobody. Take away love from brothers and sisters. They become just colleagues who are in the journey sharing the same life. Take away love from friends. So easily we become foes and we don't know when it really happened. Take away love from parents and they just become caretakers who couldn't care less what happens to you. Take away love from leaders and they become dictators who drive you at any cost. Dictators are also leaders minus love. Take away love from religion. And God becomes just a figment of our imagination. It is because you love that we feel energy. When you sit down in namaz and prayers five times a day, it is your love that is calling God, not your words. And I believe God is almost tired of our languages. He focuses more on our heart than our lips. It is important that God has given us this beautiful feeling value that has the power to change everything around you and everything within you. And you might ask me, Swamiji, does it really work? Let me give you a fact file of just feelings. Huh? Some of the wisest writers, thinkers of the world, after their entire journey, Aldous Huxley is not a lonely guy, but some of the wisest writers, thinkers after their entire journey. Look what they write. John Updike. We all know him, a Nobel Prize winner. He writes that we are most alive when we experience love. So technically all of us are alive, living. But when you experience love, suddenly you become most alive. What did Einstein write? Love is the greatest teacher. He didn't say maths. He didn't say science. He didn't say numbers. He didn't say formulae. Einstein says love is the greatest teacher. Backing him up is Tolstoy. Tolstoy says, I understand. Because I love. You try talking to anybody who doesn't love you, he will never understand you. Many times parents come to me just this morning, a very close person who is a very part of our family, he says, my son is living somewhere abroad and he just doesn't talk to me. Even if somebody is your son and there is love missing, they refuse to understand. So the part and the power of understanding is based on love again. Let's go a little further. We have Martin Luther King. He says, darkness can never drive out darkness. Only light can. Hate can never drive out hate. Only love can. You want solutions? You want to rise away above the prejudices, the biases, the hates that actually harm and harass us? Love 
again, is the only source. J.K. Rowling, the famous author of the Harry Potter series, I think all of you know she was one of the most depressed ladies of her time. Many times she herself contemplated suicide. But what does she write at the end of the entire seven books of Harry Potter, perhaps the highest selling series ever produced? You know what she writes? I'll quote, unquote her. To have been deeply loved, to have been deeply loved gives us protection forever. If you were once loved by your father or your grandfather or your neighbor or a complete stranger like us, to have been deeply loved gives you complete protection forever. You feel important on this earth. Viktor Frankl, the very famous psychologist and psychiatrist, he was a Jew and he was jailed in, into the concentration camps by Hitler. And everybody who went into the concentration camps did not count their lives by years. They counted them by not months, not weeks, not days, but they say by minutes. Oh, you are five minutes old. Good, you survived. The whole concentration camps were designed to kill. But I want to tell you, Viktor Frankl, him and his wife both entered the concentration camp together. His wife died the first day Viktor Frankl survived. After his survival, he became perhaps one of the most famous psychiatrists in the whole of Europe. Once this lady phoned him on a distant call and she asked him, you know, that she wanted to commit suicide. Viktor Frankl explained to him, no, life is worth it. Don't commit suicide. Don't take this step. This is the end, the last. Please try and live. There's so much more to have in life. And she went on and on and on and on. Viktor Frankl talked to her for almost four hours. The lady did not die. Now wait for it. After years, when that lady became a very successful businesswoman in Europe, she was being interviewed. And she was asked that once you decided to commit suicide, what was so special about Viktor Frankl? And she said, I talked to him for four hours. They asked her that in those four hours, which was the single one most important argument that convinced you that life is worth living? You know what she said? None of them. But the fact there was someone in this world who was willing to listen to me for four hours convinced me that life is worth it. <laughs> listen to your own family. You get tired so easily. Even if it's the same thing, listen, love is seen as action. It's not a noun, it's a verb. So I'm here to say some of the wisest people have continually told us that love is something much bigger and stronger than we can imagine. Khalil Gibran writes, Life without love is like a tree without blossoms or fruits. Purposeless and useless. Life without love. Oscar Wilde repeats the same idea, life without love is like a garden of dead flowers. He goes a step ahead much further. But Socrates, he puts it beautifully. Sometimes you come and tell me, Swamiji, this guy is hard to love. You don't know him. He's impossible to love. And Socrates writes philosophically, those who are hardest to love need it the most. Those who are hardest to love need it the most. And then we have the famous poets of India, Kabir, who connected to God and he connected thousands to God and he writes, Pothi padpad jagmua padha na pandita koi dhai akshar prem ka padhe so pandita hoi Even if you master and read all the scriptures of the world, if all the books of the world, you will still not become the wisest man on this earth. The guy who understands this small word, love, he becomes the most enlightened person on this earth. You don't need to go from pillar to post. Try and look into your own heart and see the mechanism of how love really works. 
But it's so easy for me to talk to you about people who had love in their heart, who loved others, who showed the path of love. Of course, you'll tell me, Swamiji, they will espouse love. But the incident I want to give you before you is from a life of a person who had nothing to do with love. Perhaps he was the most hated man in humanity. And perhaps who himself hated humanity the most? Can anybody guess the name? Come on, I think people have. F fine, agreed. <laughs> we talk about Hitler, who has actually been responsible for wars, killing, murdering, concentration camp. Actually, his army was known as the killing machine. Hitler, it is said that he hardly knew about love, but please, I'm just quoting history, eh? don't read me wrong. And everybody can have their own imaginations and you, are, you have all the rights to have your own view. But I'm just talking and quoting history, this will open your eyes in a different way. Hitler was led and misled by two women he loved most. Let me tell you, a page from history. They talk about Hitler and they say, the two women he loved most, he was led and misled. Misled how? That when Hitler was 18 years old, he fell in love with a Jewish girl, as history would have it. <laughs> Hitler, when he was 18, and whether this girl was of Jewish origin or not, nobody really knows. Her name was Stephanie Isaac. And Hitler was so madly in love, so he started stalking her, he started following her, he started, you know, uh, keeping special, you know, his friends would spy on her. Once it so happened from her book, a simple flower fell off, Hitler's friend, August Kubizek, he has written in his own memoirs of Hitler, Hitler rushed and picked up that flower. He said, I've never seen Hitler so happy and elated in having picked up a flower which was discarded by someone he loved. But the most powerful thing was, that girl had the infinite capacity to reject and ignore Hitler. It is said that perhaps his deep hatred for Jews resulted because of his failed love, imaginary love for a girl who never loved him. Even after he came into power, he made special ads in the name of this girl, whether he could find her or not. But she rejected him. So a failed love can crush a civilization. On the other end, after trying to exterminate an entire generation and a race, whatever his reasons may be, but after trying to eliminate an entire race, there is still one Jew Hitler saved, and that was Dr. Edward Bloch. He was a Jewish doctor. In 1940, the only single Jew he saved was this doctor. Do you know why? Because he treated the woman he loved most, his mother. So in 1940, he himself made passage for somebody he loved. He hated them. Yet love has a power to actually redirect your emotions. Love takes you beyond your own determinations. I am here just to tell you that love creates the magic wherever you are, provided you be a part of the love that actually has created you. You'll ask me, Swamiji, all these histories, all these lessons from history is fine. But let's talk about our life. I'm not here to preach. We are here to share our ideologies and ideas. Let's talk about our life. One man in Bahrain, he came to me and he said, Swamiji, it's so easy to talk about relationship and love, but my relations are dead. Me and my wife, we have agreed to permanently disagree. I'm still listening. He said, there's nothing that can grow. It's finished. I am here to tell you miracles still do happen. Even from dead relationships, you can revive them. Love has that power. How? Let me take you to Chicago, 
They are recent incidents, nothing from history around you and me. In Chicago, in Northwestern University, a boy, a very dynamic young leader-like boy, his name Ryan Schroeder, he was one of the best skiers of this entire university. In a snowmobile, he had an accident. In that accident, he went into coma. And the doctors tried to treat him, but the doctors felt no medicine will work because his body did not respond. You can go into coma, but slowly, if your body and your mechanism begins to respond, there is hope. Unless the body responds, responds there can be no medicine. So after a couple of weeks, the doctors washed their hands off. The doctors called the family and said, there's nothing else we can do in this medical world for this boy. He's gone, finished. The only thing I can suggest, is there anybody he loves or who loves him? The mother came forward and now listen what happened. Every day the mother would sit with this little boy, this boy, he's in a coma, and she would talk to him, knowing full well he's not listening. The doctors allowed her, just as an experiment, you know, you want to experiment, the doctors allowed her to speak to the child, knowing all well that nobody or nothing is responding. But for three weeks, day and night, when the mother kept talking to this boy again and again, he opened his eyes from the coma. Not only was he revived, but they say, in the next month, the power of the body and the mind was such that the boy recovered 100% and once again he became the champion of his skiing team. <laughs> Love has power to reach your own body and your heart. Forget about reviving old relationships. You can revive any relationship even if it's in a coma. <laughs> Go back. Go back to the people whom you've loved and who you love you. There is hope if the love is genuine, try. If it doesn't happen, leave it to God. But love revives. The second issue, I'm just talking about the issues that I found in Bahrain. I don't want to talk about across the seas and anywhere else. Some people have told us, Swamiji, we have a big issue. Once the children grow up, they are no longer in your control. That's normal, don't worry. You know, they found an old Egyptian tablet in hieroglyphics about 8,000 years old. And you know what that hieroglyphics old Egyptian tablet says? The children nowadays are not as, as well behaved as they used to be. <laughs> you have the same issue. We keep saying our times were different. No. So again, the big question that actually bugs all of us living here or all of you who are sitting in the front row when you send your children abroad. There's a secret fear in the hearts of mothers and fathers. You know, they talk about, Swamiji, we are sending him for a great education, but you fear whether he'll still remain yours or not. Because when you open the mind, <laughs> the mind is free to go anywhere. So there's a slight fear, especially in the Indian community, that if you send your children abroad, then they no longer listen to you, they are no longer yours, they may not return the way that you want them. Even in our own community, Bahraini community, you might feel suddenly they've changed. So that fear is deep within you. Now I also want to tell you that if you love something, set it free. If you really loved it, it will come back to you. And if you didn't, it never will. So love has the power to bring things which, if you have loved it genuinely, it has the power to work around the entire system that a bond will never break. Let me take you to 2011 in Brazil. On the beach of Rio de Janeiro, one simple construction worker was walking the beaches. He's a construction guy. He's not an environmentalist. He doesn't love the beach so much. He doesn't love the sands. He doesn't watch the birds. He doesn't even know about the marine life. One construction worker, his name, Joe Pereira de Souza, he was walking on the beach. Suddenly, a small baby penguin 
discarded, struggling for life, suddenly bumps into his feet. He's not even an expert. You know, he's not one of those environmentalists whose heart starts bleeding by even the thought of something. No, he is a raw, callous construction worker and a lot of things hit his feet. But suddenly he sees this baby penguin and overcome by a love, a little concern, he picks that baby penguin up. He nurses it, takes it home because he felt it was too injured. He takes it home. It takes almost 11 months for the baby penguin to learn to walk again. This is how damaged it was. This man, who's not a vet, every day, every evening, he would nurse it, take care of this baby penguin. Then once the baby penguin was fit enough, he felt the only way to show my love for this penguin is to set it free. You know, sometimes our love is possessive. The more we love, the more possessive we become. And that's what gets in the way. So he took it to the shore. He set the baby penguin free. The baby penguin floated away. Wherever it came from, wherever it wanted to go, it went. In 2012, this happened in 2011. In 2012, his regular walk on the beach, suddenly he sees a little baby penguin fluttering and coming out, walking out from the seas. But he ignored it because he's not so well-versed with animals and little penguins and marine life. So he kept walking. The penguin followed him home. And that's when he realized it's the same penguin that has returned back to his home. But it's not just a case of one year. Since 2012 till 2018, every year this baby penguin comes back to him for eight months, four months, now the scientists track that penguin with a little belt. For four months, it travels 5,000 miles to Argentina, to the breeding grounds. And after that, alone from its entire group, it comes back. For eight months, he stays at this man's house. And four months, it goes back to its own place. So I want to ask you, if a man loved a penguin just once and enough, it just took him eight months to make sure that the penguin returns every year. If you love your children enough, there is no way they will go away from your hands. They'll keep returning, returning, returning. This is the power of love. <laughs> love them once. And once is enough. But our love is not always so focused and concentrated. We say we love them. It's not focused. But sometimes you'll tell me, Swamiji, but I have loved enough. I've given my everything. But there's no cure or repair. There is no cure or repair. What should I do? You know, one lady, she was hurting. She was ill. She could never get better. The doctors kept telling her that, you know, Forgive your husband, move away, move away from the past. Your husband is dead, no longer with you. Just let go, let go, let go, it's hurting you. The lady says, how can I forgive for what she has done to me? And she said, I'm a very religious woman. I keep everything close to my heart. <laughs> I keep everything close to my heart, so I'll never let this go. At the end, the lady was never cured. But if you love going beyond your past, then you will have a great future. Another experiment and his truth straight from the scientific books, and I've seen the pictures, and we've discussed deeply with the people, is you could have anybody before you, and they could be anybody, the worst of the worst of the kinds. But if your love is genuine, it will create openings at the right time. There is a scientist, a botanist, his name is Luther Burbank. Somewhere in New Mexico, he had this fondness for cacti. He collected different breeds of cactuses, and then he grew them. One fine day, he started thinking, why does a cactus have thorns? Because it's there in the desert and to protect itself. Of course, it needs thorns from all these animals and birds that would attack it. So he said, but in my little house, in my conservatory, there is no fear for the cactus. So to experiment, he took one 
small plant of a cactus. And every day he started talking to this cactus and stroking it very carefully because you can't stroke it like this. Stroking the, one of the leaf of the cactus gently with his hands and saying, you do have nothing to fear, I'm your friend. You don't need the thorns. There is love and nothing else for you in this place. Every day, and I've seen pictures, I've seen the official videos as well, on the same plant of cactus, a new leaf erupted and that leaf did not have a single thorn. If a plant can respond to love, then don't come and tell me that humans can't. Love has the power to reform. Love has the power to revive. Love has the power to unite. But sitting here in this hall, you will again tell me, Swamiji, but why doesn't it work with me? Why doesn't it work with me? Well, let me tell you. Because as I mentioned right in the beginning, of course it would work with you. But most of our love, as our Indian scriptures explain, now this is a little philosophical, but go home and think about it. Our Indian scriptures explain that the problem with our love is what? Navare patyu kamaya pati priyo bhavati, atmanastu kamaya pati priyo bhavati. The Sanskrit saying says that we, the wife says that I love my husband. And the answer it is not that you love your husband, you love yourself more and because your husband loves you, that's why you love your husband. Try living with a husband who doesn't love you, you no longer love him. Navare, jaya kamaya jaya priya bhavati, atmanastu kamaya jaya priya bhavati. The man says, I love my wife. You love your wife because you love yourself most and because your wife is kind and she loves you in return. That's why you love your wife. Start, try living with a wife who doesn't love you at all. You stop loving her. And the third sentence is, Navare putranam kamaya putraha priya bhavanti atmanastu kamaya putraha priya bhavanti. We say we love our children at any cost. But we love our children because our children obey us and love us in return. Try and love children who do not obey you. It's difficult. Ultimately, the scriptures say at the end of the day, we love ourselves most. That's why we try and share those love. But spiritual love is far beyond the selfish love that we have. Try and make your love a little selfless. Do things for people without the hope of return. Can you bring a smile to a complete stranger who gives you nothing? Forget about giving something to somebody who dislikes you or hates you. No. Can you rise beyond the limitations of our human beings? A little selflessness. Even after talking about the power of love, let's do a quick experiment. We all know that love is powerful, right? Yes or no? Let me hear yes or no. We know love can revive. We know love can bring back the dead relationships. Love can bring up back our children. Love can influence animals. Love can influence plants. Love can influence the entire cosmos. We know, right? Love is the most important. All these wise people have said, animal Hitler a little bit, he has said that as well from his life. He hasn't said it, but he's lived it. So let's experiment. If I stand before you, if you allow me, honorable minister, if I stand before you and I say about, I talk 10 minutes about you, that Dr. Mirza, but I've got a paper and I'm trying to read, I can't even pronounce your name properly. I said, ah, Dr. Um, uh, Mirza, he's a nice person and uh, he's good, uh, he's a wonderful chap. And if I keep talking like that, which all of you know, that it's read and not meant. Even if I talk 10 minutes about you without love, would you prefer that or would you prefer just one word? Thank you for being with us, Dr. Mirza. What would you prefer, one word with love or 10 minutes without love? Huh? Everybody. 
One word we love. Are we all on the same boat, right? We believe that one word of love is far more important than a whole book without love. Clear? Suppose I invite you to come to our place to eat. Many of you have, and I will honor it once. Suppose I invite you to come to our place to eat, and I, pr I produce a feast of delicacies. But when you come, I bang the dish saying, here, eat. A feast without love? Or simple, if I just give you a warm glass of milk and say, here, please, can you please drink it? It's made by me. What would you prefer, a feast without love or a glass of milk with love? Are we clear? Once again, what would you prefer? A feast without love or a glass of milk with love? Correct? Now suppose we go out of this hall and there's a man waiting for you and said, Oh, sir, I've been waiting since one month. I love you so much. I have come and saved this one dinar. Please accept this one dinar with a lot of my love. And there's somebody else who says, starts abusing you and shouting you that you're a fool, you're no good, you're bad, and nothing. Here, take one million dinar. What would you take? One dinar with love or one million dinar without love? <laughs> Start thinking. <laughs> come on, come on. We've just thrown out love out of the window. <laughs> Almost half an hour I've been talking about love and suddenly see what happens. Because all of you are going to go back into the same world. We're going to go back to the same family. We're going to go back to the same friends. Because we are selfish, we really can't love beyond our own self. We pretend that we love others. You know, it's like taking a camera and taking, you know, pointing the camera at everybody else. And everybody thinks you are taking their picture, but all the while we are on selfie mode. Click, <laughs> click, 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 click. All the while we keep telling people we love others, but we are always on selfie mode. We love us, ourselves, ourselves. True spiritual love, be it from an imam, be it from the leaders, be it from Allah, be it from Krishna, be it from Swami Narayan, be it from Pramukh Swami, Mahan Swami. True spiritual love is the love that makes you selfless. It's a love that takes you beyond your own body and the world that we live in and helps you touch the cosmic feelings of God. That's true spiritual love. That's why if you really want to love, deep down in your heart you have to become spiritual. It's lovely writing romantic poems. A time will come when you'll have to someday change a little romance towards God. That is going to really power you from within. True spiritual love will make you selfless to such an extent that you become bigger than yourself. And you will have a heart wherein the whole world will be able to live. It's not just your own home. It's not just your own people. When Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the great famous scientist, the inventor of the nuclear bomb, he was a profound Muslim. When he met Pramukh Swami Maharaj, he, he, they depicted what love should be. They did not know the languages, as I have said before. One is a scientist, one is a spiritual man, one 48 PhDs, one hardly passed even the primary. But Kalam said one thing, remember when? after he had become one of the finest engineers of India, after he became one of the greatest aeronautical scientists, after he became the father of India's missiles, after he became the father of India's nuclear bomb, after he became the president of India, at a time when he was most loved, even now you ask all the Indians, who would you want as the president of India? Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, without a doubt. At the peak of his career, after achieving everything and having met most world leaders and scientists and thinkers, 
Even great spiritual leaders, when he came to our spiritual head, Pramukh Swami, Kalam chose to sit on the floor. On the floor. Swamiji was sitting and Swamiji was talking to him and that's when Kalam has told Pramukh Swami. He said, you have taught me the greatest lessons of life. Now what is the greatest lesson of life? A person who has done everything in his life. You know, many can become the president but they're not the most loved. And there are presidents but because they don't have any knowledge of science. You could be a great scientist but you never invented anything. Yes, you've invented something but nothing of substance. You've not done something that changes the course of history. Everything Kalam had done. Still at the end of his journey, he came to Pramukh Swami and said, you have taught me the greatest lesson of life. You know what the lesson he said? How to remove I and how to remove me. Do you want to love? Go beyond your ego. One man, he came to Pramukh Swami and he said, I want love. All of us are hungering for love. What did he say? I want love. Swami said, first cancel the I. That's ego. And cancel the want, demand. And all you have is love. From your life, from the equation of your life, remove yourself. Well, that's going to be difficult. From the equation of your life, remove rights and demands. And the only thing that will remain available for you is love. You will love and others will begin to love you. That is spiritual love. And that's why at the most challenging moments of your own life, you know, love is valued not because what it does to others. When you love selflessly, the biggest beneficiary is you. Love is valued for what it makes you. Pramukh Swami Maharaj, our spiritual head, even at the age of 95, all his life he had moved from house to house, hut to hut, country to country, person to person, all his life. Yes, he built 1,200 temples, but not a single temple under his name, owned nothing. Yes, he visited 250,000 homes, but not a single home was his. He never stayed anywhere. Yes, he wrote 750,000 letters, but never an application for himself. They were all notes to help others. Yes, he counseled millions of people for their little problems, but never spoke of the ailments and the problems that he faced as a human being. You'll be amazed when I tell you of the 1,200 temples. I'm talking about huge, world-famous temples. The temple in London is in the Guinness Book of World Records. The temple in Delhi is the largest in the world. The temple in Chicago, they are all amazing. They are the landmarks of their places. And in the, the temple in Abu Dhabi, I was just talking, it is civilization. It is going to bring cultures and civilizations together for mankind. But you will be amazed that of the 1,200 temples that he built, you might have built one home, two homes. Of the 1,200 temples he built, get ready. 1100 he built after his first heart attack. And 1000 temples he built after his quintuple bypass. When you don't care what happens to you, and you don't care who gets the credit, there is no limit to what we can achieve with our love. This is the power of spirituality. We move across, go beyond yourself, and when you help somebody in a genuine way, it does more for you and the people around you. I'll leave you last with a small story which is very close to my heart, and please remember it. Whether it's a legend, whether it's true or not, whether it's history, but look at the message. Once in the US, somewhere in Pennsylvania, and about near about New Jersey, one boy, about 15, 16 years old, 
in the year 1873. He was going home to home trying to search for a job to get a little pay, doing odd jobs at home to get a little pay and then pay his fees for studies. From place to place he did not find proper odd end jobs. So for four or five days he had gone hungry and he was so famished. He decided the next home I knock on, I will ask for a meal. That's almost begging. But when he knocked on that door, a beautiful girl opened up the door, suddenly smitten by her good looks. And he was a boy of the similar age. He suddenly felt a little embarrassed. And the girl asked, uh, what do you want? How could he ask or beg for a meal from such a beautiful lady? So he said, um, uh, can I have a glass of water? <laughs> water you can ask, because you are thirsty, you are a traveler. And the little girl went back in. She came with a glass of milk. The boy took the glass of milk. He was hungry. Without letting any secrets out, he drank the glass of milk, gulped it down, almost famished. And yet in his arrogance, he asked the girl, um, how much do I owe you? He had nothing. He didn't have a dime. But still, you know, men, have, men are men. So they didn't want to let down. They didn't want to feel that they are something less. So he said, how much do I owe you? The girl, she was not just beautiful. She also had a great value system. She said that my mother has told me that never get paid for kindness. So it's free. Never get paid for kindness. The boy left and he felt so high, so good. His faith in humanity and people was revived because this act of love and kindness. He went back to his studies, worked hard. Days went on and on. After a few years, fast forward into the future, this girl became a lady. She contacted a terminal illness which could not be cured. And this was, remember, the 1800s, late 1800s. And from her village, she was shifted to Boston, where she would be treated by expert doctors. Dr. Howard Kelly, he was called upon to treat this girl, lady. In seeing the patient, instantly Dr. Howard Kelly, the boy had gone on to become a great doctor. On seeing the woman, he instantly recognized this is the same lady who had actually revived my spirit. So he took the case upon. Consultants was called, Dr. Howard Kelly was a special gynecologist and a specialist and a researcher. And Dr. Howard Kelly was not an ordinary guy. If you know medicine, he was one of the four founders of John Hopkins Medical College and Hospital. Very famous doctor himself. So when he was treating this woman, he took about one and a half months trying to cure her at any cost. Fortunately, as life would have it, she was cured. But then she was worried about the bill. The bigger the hospital, the bigger the city, the greater the bill. And as she was waiting for the bill, Dr. Howard Kelly sent the bill to her. Under the bill it was written, paid in full with a glass of milk. <laughs> How many glasses of milk you could have given and you haven't. How many smiles can you give? How many ears can you give to the people whom you love? All I ask you today, even if you love God a little less, don't forget to love your children, your family members, people who are closest to you, because they make your life worthwhile. Thank you very much.